So uh, today he's going to talk about uh, some methods to navigate the educational system, and I uh, look forward to hearing about it. So, so welcome, yeah. Dr. Tolliver. Thanks. And there's a, a one-pager going around, so if you haven't gotten it, maybe you can grab a page. But it's 11 questions that hopefully you can look over just to kind of prime your brain, because this is a material that we'll be covering during the talk that I think is particularly relevant. And so as we go through it, if you want to kind of think through, like, how would you answer these questions? How would you fill them in? Uh, then we can kind of discuss it at the end. But... Um, I'm going to talk about how do we navigate school systems, particularly around this thing called RTI and kids who might have specific learning disorders. So I don't have any disclosures. Um, so the learning objectives are we're going to look at how do you actually define and classify specific learning disorders. And then hopefully by the end you'll get at least an introductory understanding about what this thing called RTI is. It's this system that helps identify kids who are struggling in reading or math and get them some extra help. And also we're going to talk about this particular pathway that these kids take in the school system that might qualify them for an individualized education program through um, the special education process. And then finally, kind of practically, what are you going to do when kids come into your clinic and they have academic concerns? What's kind of your role in being an advocate for the family and for the child? So at least in the Gen Peds clinic, I think this is kind of a familiar story where a kid uh, comes home, they have a bunch of F's on the report card, mom eventually finds out about it, she's shocked, she's upset, and uh, maybe she might try to communicate a little bit with the school, doesn't really totally understand what's going on. And so, uh, Dr. Smith, who does she go to next to try to figure out what to do? She goes to the doctor. She goes to you, right? And that doesn't really look like you, but she goes to the <laughs> pediatrician, right? We did, uh, uh, a couple years ago, Dr. Palaha did a study that asked, when you have a psychosocial concern with your kid, who do you go to, who do you trust? And the number one place people go is to their pediatrician. And so they're coming to see you, and as a good pediatrician, you want to help. And so you've probably heard that to figure out if a kid has a specific learning disorder, then you might need to get some psychoeducational testing done at the school. So you, in good conscience, write a prescription for psychoed testing, or you recommend that the child receive psychoed testing at the school. You come up with a great plan with the parent about it. You send them to the school. Mom still looks a little shocked, but she takes your prescription and she goes to the school, and she's probably going to be met kind of with a brick wall, honestly. She's going to be met with school staff that talk about this thing called RTI, blah, 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 and your kid has this so many data points, blah, 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 all of this technical language. It's going to be hard for even us to understand if you don't really get that system. And probably what's going to happen is everybody's going to end up upset, right? Because the school's going to think, what right do you have, doctor, of kind of telling us what we should be doing if you don't fully understand the system here? And then you're thinking, well, school, why haven't you already address this situation uh, and then the parents kind of caught in the middle of all of that right so through this talk we're going to hopefully figure out how can we have a little bit better ending to this story so the last couple weeks i've been behind enemy lines here on the school's perspective thinking through what is the school actually doing and what's the process that's that's going on so i talked to the director of school psychology for the state of tennessee in nashville and the director of special ed for Johnson City Schools, and then waded through this 300-page RTI manual in, on Tennessee.gov. So strap in, it's going to be exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really fun, but Sarah makes fun of me for thinking this stuff is cool. Um, so first of all, we have to define, get on the same page about a few basic terms, right? So Dr. Widener, how would you define basic reading? What does that mean? That, I love that definition. That's great. You did an awesome <laughs> job. Right? So it's being able to take individual letters and understand that they're associated with particular sounds, right? To decode language. Reading fluency, on the other hand, is how do you 
Um, are you able to quickly and accurately read? Okay, and then reading comprehension, it's pretty understandable. Can you understand what you're reading? Um, and then with math and writing, math calculation is, you know, four plus four is eight, right? Can you understand the basic components of numbers and retrieve facts in order to do calculations? Um, math problem solving, I think about those questions back in grade school where it was like a paragraph, but it was a math question, you had to figure it out. You have to use other skills like problem solving and language and reading and bring those all together to solve the problem. And then written expression is, can you take the things in your mind and actually put them down on paper? Okay. So how do we actually define a specific learning disorder though using DSM terminology? So you have to have a learning problem in some area, right? We know that, but it actually has to be present for more than six months and not just more than six months. It has to be present that long despite the provision of interventions that target those difficulties. So that's something important to remember that's going to come up later. So you have to have a problem and then you have to try to fix it, but it still not be fixed very well. And you can have it in one of these six categories, slow and effortful word reading, that reading fluency, trouble understanding what you're reading, problems with spelling or writing, and then all of those problems with math. You have to have that plus the key is the skills are substantially and quantifiably below what you would expect for a kid that age. And they cause some kind of impairment. So it's not just enough to have a learning uh, problem. It has to cause impairment in some way. And how are we going to measure it? We're going to measure it by individually administered uh, achievement tests, right? So that's where this psychoed testing comes in that lots of people talk about. Most of these uh, develop early in the school years, but if you have a kid who has a pretty high IQ, you know, you might actually uh, not be until second or third grade that this comes up because it's at that point that the demands of the school actually outmatch what the kid's capable of doing. But you might see it come up as early as kindergarten or first grade. And then this other point is really important too. You have to rule out a bunch of other environmental factors that could expand primarily explain these problems. So it can't be due to a low IQ or visual or hearing problems. It can't be due to a lack of education, right? So if the kid misses half the school year because they're sick, the school's not going to classify them with a specific learning disorder because they can't rule out the fact that it was due to inadequate instruction. Um, so that's pretty wordy. The three things that you really should just memorize and that are going to come up at the end of the presentation again are to, for a specific learning disorder, you have to have a low level of reading, right? We said substantially and quantifiably lower. You have to have a low rate of learning. Um, and so even with targeted intervention, you're not catching up to grade level like other people um, other peers in the class. And then finally, the third one is it's not due to bunch of other factors, right? Those are kind of the three main things that you want to kind of memorize, take with you low level of learning, low rate of learning, and not due to other factors. So when you're taking a history, um, those could be kind of three areas that you want to think about. And one of them even says not due to psychosocial adversity. I don't know how people are ruling that out because I think that's just across the board, right? Some things are hard to, to rule out. And then uh, you have three major categories that you can have a learning disorder in, reading, writing, and math. And when you would give a diagnosis, you would actually specify the subcategory within those that uh, it would fall under. So back in the good old days, they had something called the discrepancy model. Okay, so this is a normal curve. Standard scores are average of 100 with a standard deviation of 15. So this kid has an IQ uh, of 100 and a reading score of 100. So Dr. Lindsay, do you think this kid probably has a specific learning disorder? Well, all we have is reading, so. In reading, do you in think? Reading? No. No, right? Why not? I mean, they're not below like any of the standard deviations of normal. That's right. So they're average to begin with, and there's not a huge discrepancy between their IQ and their achievement. So Really, we're looking in that old model, you'd look for two standard deviation discrepancy between their IQ and their achievement. Um, and so 
Uh, for this one, this kid had an IQ of 85 and their reading score was also an 85. So that was one standard deviation uh, below the mean. So Dr. Nichols, do you think this kid has a specific learning disorder in reading based on that? Tennessee doesn't think so, right? Good answer. Uh, so, but is this kid going to struggle compared to other kids in his class? Yeah, probably he will. Uh, but the IQ kind of matches up with the academic achievement. So he's going to struggle, but he's not going to qualify for special education or any extra services probably under this model. And so the, really what you would be seeing is this kind of profile in this old discrepancy model where the kid's IQ is average, but his reading score on the standardized test is like two standard deviations below the mean. So this kid's going to get labeled with a specific learning disorder in reading. Uh, so this discrepancy model really is trying to eliminate low IQ as the main reason uh, for these learning problems. And it's targeting kids with that most likely have a learning problem. And they give them a series of standardized tests, usually administered by a school psychologist, with the primary aim of just figuring out, does this kid meet criteria as having a disability? It turns out that maybe the good old days weren't so great because although this was a quick way to assess kids uh, and pretty easy and straightforward, it was kind of a wait to fail system, right? You had to wait until you had this two standard deviations gap between your IQ and achievement. And so what are you gonna do in the meantime? You're not getting any extra help or any extra interventions. And it's not really a, a, uh, um, taking into account other environmental factors that could cause those low reading scores or those low mass scores. And if you're borderline, like, like the kid even who was the 85 that we looked at, like that kid needs some extra help and intervention as well. And so this model really wasn't addressing that. Um, and so in 2004, the individual, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act said that states, you don't have to use this model anymore if you don't want to, you're not mandated to. And so RTI is what has replaced this model. Okay, it's how kids get identified um, for extra help. And so the main purpose of RTI is to eliminate inadequate instruction as the main reason for these learning problems. And so it's not just targeting kids that we really, really think have a learning problem, a uh, learning disability, but also struggling readers and kids who are struggling in math. And we're going to give them lots of small little assessments, ongoing progress monitoring, collect a bunch of data and use that data to make decisions about how the kid is taught in real time. So let's, let's take the data that we're collecting and modify our teaching practices right now to try to help them out. And so these little probes that they get throughout the year are primarily given by the general education teacher, not the school psychologist, and it's used to guide instructional placement. Any questions so far on any of that? Okay, so now we'll get into RTI. In Tennessee, it's called RTI squared, Response to Intervention and Instruction Framework. And it has a couple required elements to it. So uh, one of those is uh, universal screening. So for kids in kindergarten through eighth grade, three times a year, you're gonna get these benchmark assessments in math and reading to see how you compare to other kids nationally. And if you score below a certain percentile, you're going to get then pulled into this RTI system for extra help. So tier, there's three tiers. Tier one is everybody, right? And if you get below a certain percentile, you'll get pulled into tier two or tier three. And we talked about part of it is this progress monitoring too. And that means you're going to give these little probes multiple times every week or every other week you're in this RTI process to see how you're doing. Another uh, element that this set up was school level and district level teams, RTI teams, where every four or five weeks these teams meet and they look at all the data from all the kids in RTI and they make decisions about what do we need to do? Do we need to change their placement? Do we need to modify who's teaching them? How do we kind of uh, make it where they're going to have the best learning environment? And then there's all these fidelity checks to make sure they're doing that in a standardized way. Also, parents get notified every four or five weeks with a letter that says, this is how your kid's doing. So 
a kid, a parent might show up in your office with this letter that says, you know, your kid's progressing, they're not progressing, and most of the time parents have no clue even what that letter means or is referencing. Um, so this is the RTI framework for Tennessee in tier one that's supposed to meet the needs of about 80 to 85 percent of kids. And it's supposed to be really high quality research-based instruction for everybody, just on the general education level. Um, and if you score below the 25th percentile on one of those three benchmark tests that go throughout the year, then you get pulled into tier two, right? And tier two means you get pulled out of your class for probably 30 extra minutes um, during the day and you're gonna get in a small group some extra tutoring around reading or math. Um, and that's gonna serve probably 10 to 15% of kids in a school. And the, the issue though is they're not gonna just do that automatically. They're making these database decisions. So they're gonna have four of these progress monitoring data points before they do any changes. Um, and once you're in tier two, they're gonna have 10 to 15 of these data points before they decide whether or not to move you up to tier three or not. So this is why it can kind of feel frustrating a little bit for parents and families and us sometimes too, because this is a quite a long process sometimes. But we shouldn't think about it as kind of a wait to fail system because they're getting intervention this whole time and they're trying to tailor it and adapt it to the kid during this time too. Um, so depending on the school, they'll do these little probes every week or every other week. And then even after that, if kids still aren't progressing, then they'll move to tier three. And that is gonna serve three to 5% of kids. It's usually like 45 to 60 minutes extra every day in these small groups. And it's for kids who are scoring below the 10th percentile or about two grade levels behind other kids on these benchmark tests. And then once you get into tier three, you need another 10 to 15 data points before the school would then refer you for an IEP through special education. Practically what happens though is sometimes kids get bounced around between these tiers and it, and it lasts a long time. Um, so we'll talk at the end about how to advocate for those kids. So this is one example of uh, some of the data that the, the teachers might look at during one of these RTI meetings. And so this is the word, number of words read correctly, and each little red data point is one of these little progress monitoring probes. The black line is what the kids should be achieving at grade level, right? Kind of their goal. And the green is the number of errors they're making. Kind of, you don't have to worry about that as much. The red is the number of words they're getting correctly. So what do you, uh, how would you interpret this data, Dr. Boley? Mm, it seems like he's, <clears throat> as he's going on, he's not Yeah, the red trend line is not going in the right direction for him, right? Um, and so this is a kid that the school would likely identify as, oh, we need to change something up. This is not working for this kid. So kind of the little case study um, is that this kid's in tier two and they've, they've done you know about nine points of progress monitoring. He's not making uh, progress and so they got to figure out what to do next. And so they, what, how they figure it out is looking at the data, right? Looking at the graphs. And they do something called a gap analysis. They try to see um, what is the gap between the red line and the black line? And is that gap closing or is it getting bigger? And how long is it gonna take for them to actually catch up? And so you can see here the green bars are kind of kids scoring in the average range. And then the blue dots are the individual kids score. So on the left, you can see this would be a profile of a kid who's closing the gap, right? Each probe, he's getting a little bit, a little bit closer to that average range. You can see kind of by the slope of the line where the kid on the right is not, right? He's not really ever getting any closer to catching up to grade level. So these are the kind of things that the school would look at and, and the kind of graph that parents may bring into you to interpret. So the gap analysis measures the gap between the student's current performance and their expected level of performance or that benchmark, right? And so if you kind of, an example would be maybe a second grader is supposed to be able to read 68 words per minute, 
they're only able to read 25. So you divide those out and you come up with 2.72 is the gap. And in the schools, gaps of two or more are, pretty, are considered very significant and the school will likely take action on changing the intervention based on that. And so um, being able just to kind of understand that terminology sometimes if you ever do talk with schools um, and be able to speak that lingo can be helpful. So gaps of two or above are significant. So uh, going on with this case example, um, let's say the, the reading RTI coach decides to do some diagnostic testing to see if she can figure out what specifically is the problem for this kid. And after giving him a phonics screener, she sees that he's struggling with many of the common phonics patterns. Phonics is like being able to associate you know, letter combinations with particular sounds, like TH sounds like th, right? And so uh, the, at their little weekly uh, support meeting, they discuss his case and they talk to the teacher, they talk to the RTI teacher, and they develop a plan where they're going to get him a research-based um, explicit phonics intervention. And they're going to track his project progress weekly on that. So uh, it's trying to determine, here's your specific area of deficit with reading, and not just giving you a general RTI intervention, but let's match your specific deficit to a specific uh, learning intervention. So this is uh, this kid's progress after they switched him to uh, the new intervention. So uh, Dr. Winkowski, what do you think? Did it work? Did it not work? Looks much it looks much better, right? We're going in the right direction at least, right? Uh, and I think a, an interesting point about this is they didn't raise his level of RTI. They didn't move him to tier three. He didn't need special education. He just needed the intervention that was appropriate for him. So I think it talks about, it speaks to the value of matching the intervention to their area of deficit. He didn't need more intervention, he just needed the right intervention. Um, and so when this rate of improvement is low, there's a couple of things that the school can do. Uh, they can give the, set, uh, the RTI interventions more frequently, they can change the type of intervention. Maybe it's just a thing that the kid doesn't like that particular teacher and they need to change up who's delivering the intervention or the time of day for it. Um, and then at, at all else fails, they can change the tier. So this is another, another child that um, was in tier two and then it shows when, the, the, the vertical line shows when they were in tier three. This is a kid who needed to go to tier three to be able to make that progress, right? You can kind of see the line, the gap was widening between the, the red and the black line until they changed tiers and now it's getting better. So. I think this is pretty cool, actually, that, that schools are using data to make some of these decisions and tracking kids' progress over time. Um, so that's RTI. RTI is not special education. It's regular education, but it's a pathway by which schools can start to understand if a kid might be at risk of having a disability and then refer them to that process. So we're going to talk a little bit about how schools on their own without even you requesting it or the parent requesting it might uh, refer a child for an IEP. So this is how the school sees it. The school sees a psychoeducational evaluation or this comprehensive IEP eval is kind of the equivalent of an MRI, okay? So a kid coming in with a headache across the board, you're not gonna give every kid coming in with a headache an MRI, right? But there's a certain profile of kid, if they meet certain conditions, that you're definitely going to send them for one, right? But it's kind of an expensive, limited resource, so you're not just going to give it to everybody. And that's how the way the school sees these psychoed evals, right? They're time consuming, they're intensive, and not every kid with an academic concern needs one, right? You, but definitely kids who meet a certain profile, it is appropriate. So we're going to go through what the state of Tennessee defines as appropriate. You can agree or disagree, but this is what the state of Tennessee says is we're not going to refer for an IEP evaluation until kids meet these specific criteria. So one is, th is that they have to have had tier three RTI interventions daily, 60 minutes a day, uh, to be able to, um, before they're referred. They have to have eight to ten bi-monthly data points in tier three 
and still not doing well before they refer. And they have to have met all of these fidelity checks and, and have shown up and not been absent for at least 80% of these interventions, which we know practically is a real struggle for many of the kids that we see. Um, and they have to have ruled out all of these other environmental factors. So when you think about that, you can see why sometimes these kids are in RTI for a really long time, especially if they're absent for a long time. Um, and again, I think thinking back to uh, what we talked about before from the DSM criteria, you need a low level of learning, a low rate of learning, and not do the other factors. This exact same thing comes up in the Tennessee paperwork, right? This is directly from their manual. Condition one, low level of learning, right, in one of these categories. Condition two, low rate of learning, and they define, the school defines that as you're not responsive to RTI. That's how we know, you know, your rate of learning is not sufficient. And then the third condition is ruling out all of those other factors. So the way that Tennessee defines low level of learning is you can do it a couple different ways, but they define it as below the 10th percentile on some of these uh, benchmark assessments that kids get throughout the year, or below the 10th percentile on some of these RTI progress monitoring points if you've had three in a row that are very low, or if you got psychoed testing and you were 1.25 standard deviations below the mean. So it can be in a couple different ways, but it's very specific kind of check marks about this is the only way you can qualify for having a sufficiently low level of learning. Um, and then the way that they figure out the rate of learning is this um, tool called the student's rate of improvement. And that's kind of based on that gap analysis of how quickly is the kid catching up, right? Are they gonna be able to catch up by the end of the year through this RTI intervention or not. And if they're not, then they kind of meet the criteria. They can check off that, okay, this kid's rate of learning is sufficiently slow. But they're only gonna be able to figure out this criteria by going through RTI. And then, of course, ruling out all those other factors that we had talked about, environmental factors, hearing impairments being absent, you know, trauma history. If you've been severely abused this year, that could explain a lot of your learning problems that aren't related to a specific learning disorder. Um, so the Department of Education at the federal level issued a memo that said, RTI cannot be used by schools to delay or deny a parent's request for an IEP evaluation. Okay, so that's, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. So what we've talked about so far is the whole process schools will go through if you leave them on their own, right, to get a kid to an IEP eval. But the parent always can kind of reserve the right at any time, no matter where they are in the RTI process, to request an IEP evaluation. However, if the school doesn't suspect a disability is present, then they can deny the evaluation. And then it's kind of like a court system. The parents can appeal that decision, they can ask for an independent evaluation, and then it goes on from there in this due process period. Or the school can say, yes, we agree, we are also worried, and then we will implement, and, uh, we'll implement an IEP eval, and that has to be done within 60 days. So uh, if you kind of think about it, to summarize, if any time a school suspects a disability, they have to evaluate. But RTI is a big source of data that's going to clue them in that there is a disability. So practically, if a kid's been in RTI for four weeks, you, it's probably not the best idea to go recommend psychoeducational testing because the school's practically probably going to deny it, and probably for good reason, right? Like you want to be able to tell whether the kid's responsive to, inter, you know, to interventions or not. Um, and to kind of remember that RTI is an intervention in itself, and it should be kind of modified on a monthly basis at least to, to try to dial in for that particular kid uh, how things are going. Um, and so I think you have to use just, we have to use good judgment about when, what, under what criteria would you actually recommend uh, a family go and get psychoed testing or, or request an IEP eval. I think you need to First, kind of be fully aware of what has the school already done and what level are they in RTI and kind of what other factors are there to consider. Um, 
So now let's talk about kind of what is your role in all of this. Um, there, this is just like a lot of really specific information. And so I've taken all this and put it into a one pager that this afternoon is going to be posted all on the clinic so you can reference it with all these points if you want to. But yes. Thank you. Uh, is my impression that under the IDEA that if a parent requests an IEP evaluation or psychoed evaluation in writing with a date, that they actually had clock started where they had to respond to that with some type of evaluation, not maybe not a full psychoed evaluation. But are you saying that they can actually deny that request? Yeah, so the question was kind of the thought was if a parent formally requests in writing uh, an IEP eval, doesn't the school at least have to do some evaluation? And uh, it only if the language is if the school suspects a disability is present, they must evaluate. But if they don't suspect a disability, they don't have to evaluate. They don't have to do any of the evaluation. They have to provide something called prior written notice. It's a formal written letter to the parents that explains why they're not going to do the eval. And then from there, that's where the parents can appeal it if they want. Um, and so we help families in the clinic write these form letters, you know, to request an IEP eval. Th when they turn that letter in, that doesn't start the 60-day clock. There's actually a permission form uh, that the school has that the family, the parent has to sign that gives the school permission to evaluate. And the clock doesn't start until the family member signs the school's version of that form. Uh, and then from there, the school has 60 days to do the evaluation if they agree to do it. Um, so that's why I think the more you kind of know the history and where they are, the more you can formulate that letter requesting it with more kind of facts and rationale for why you think something should be done. So good question though. So uh, let's go back to our kid and, and uh, Dr. Smith here in the corner, right? Uh, so practically when a kid comes in uh, with academic concerns, you should be asking, is your child an RTI? And about 3% of the time, the parents will say, yeah, I know what this is about. Let me tell you all about it. And then you can ask, well, what tier are they in? And what subjects is the RTI targeting? And how long have they been in it? And are they progressing? Um, and you know, I think it's helpful to, and I put this in our one pager that'll be at the clinic, but I think it's helpful to kind of know a little bit about these, how many data points the school usually uses before they're going to go to the next level. Because then you can have in the back of your mind what, like, where are they in this whole process? Um, but what do you think happens most of the time when you say, is your child an RTI? I don't know. <laughs> That's right. Like, what are you talking about, right? And so I think it's helpful to have a practical 30 second little spiel about how are you going to explain this to a family, to a parent, and, and what this is all about. Because I think schools don't do a, a very good job of helping families understand this process, unfortunately. This is how I usually do it. I'll, I would say RTI stands for Response to Intervention and Instruction. It's not special education, mom. It's a program at your kid's school that helps identify kids who might need some extra help in math or reading and get them that help. And it's got these three levels or these three tiers and you get more help at each tier. And so your kid's gonna be pulled out of class, probably their specials class, for 30 to 45 minutes to get that extra help. And the school's gonna track your kid's progress um, every week or every two weeks. And they're gonna send you letters in the mail. So expect to get that to see how your kid's doing. And so if you want more information or you think your kid's not doing well, um, then I would highly recommend you set up a parent-teacher conference and ask the school's RTI person to be there to explain all this to you, to show you your kid's graphs, and to explain what the school's plan is to help your child out. So uh, you can also give them, there's a really nice handout that is called A Parent's Guide to Response to Intervention that I'll have at the clinic if you all want. Um, and it has a whole list of questions that it recommends parents ask at these parent-teacher conferences to kind of really understand where their kids are at. Um, and then, of course, the mom's going to be like, wow, you're an amazing doctor. I'm going to recommend everybody to come to you because you explain that so well. Um, so what I want to do is 
uh, pair up for 30 seconds and I want you to practice explaining what RTI is to your mom or dad next to you in 30 seconds and then switch. All right, so just practice actually talking through it. What, what, how could you explain it? What are you going to say? And this is your little prompt if you need it. All right, so let's, let's wrap up your amazing explanations there. So Dr. Boley had a question, who is on the RTI team? Is that what you're saying? So uh, in the schools, there are certain teachers that are kind of designated as like, you're specially trained to be able to work with kids with learning disabilities. And so you're gonna get, you're gonna kind of, they're gonna be a part of that team. So on the basic level, you have the RTI instructors delivering the intervention, and then each school will have an RTI coordinator, and then each district will have an RTI coordinator that coordinates all of the individual schools. And so when I talk to the director of special ed for Johnson City Schools, she's actually going to send us uh, a whole directory of every person in each school and who's the head of RTI in each school so that when we have a concern, we know who exactly to call and ask about some of this stuff. So the uh, the RTI teacher. So you would like you would you would be in your English class with your regular teacher, and then in at gym you might be pulled out, and you might go with a different teacher that leads an RTI group, and they teach kind of a group of kids in extra help in reading, and then every week or two that teacher is going to give some of these little probes and see how they do, and communicate back with the the regular teacher about how the kids' progress is doing. Tier one is just, just typical, just yeah, basically. yeah. Tier one is you're only get, you're not going to be getting it every week or two weeks. Mm -hmm. That's just three times a year okay. in tier one. And then once you get into tier two is when it starts to every week or every other week. Yeah. Um, so your role, we talked about, you know, ask about RTI status, explain what it is, offer a handout, and then I think your job is to assess for what other conditions could explain this disorder or what could be comorbid with it, um, medically, developmentally, behaviorally, and that's where the behavioral health team, I think, can help you out too. Um, and I think a big thing is trying to help equip families and parents with the skills to advocate for themselves for their for kids. because they're gonna have to work on this through multiple years probably. So I think it's helpful to call behind the scenes and talk with the school, but I think it's helpful also to recommend, hey, go meet with your teacher, right? Set up a parent-teacher conference so that you can discuss this more and open those lines of communication because practically a lot of the families I talk with, they haven't met with the teacher at all um, to address these concerns. And then as needed, um, involve the resource team. They can help you obtain releases of information and I would recommend asking for their grades, the RTI progress monitoring, any IEPs that are present, 
any psychoid testing they've done and, and attendance records so that you can have a better sense of, you know, let's get all the data and then we can look at it and see if the kid's getting, from our perspective, the right intervention. And then you can use the BHC team if you're in the Gen Peds clinic um, for extended education on any of this stuff or to help kind of look through that data. So from my perspective, I'm not gonna be as helpful until I have all of that data, right? So if you have, um, if you have a kid that's initially presenting with academic concerns, get a release, you know, let's get the records, and then you can have them follow up with me or during a co-visit with me where we could look at all the data together and see what we need to do. I think big red flags for me are if the kids failed a whole grade, um, if they have a family history of learning problems, or if they've been in RTI over a year. I think those are pretty big red flags of we need to really think seriously about what the next steps are. Um, but for kids who are just kind of midway through or starting the RTI system, I probably would hold off on formally requesting an IEP right then because you kind of want to see is this going to help the kid, right? And give them a chance, give them time to do that. Um, but for the kids that we want to help with an IEP, um, there are some form letters that I have that I'm happy to share that, uh, that would help initiate that uh, process in the school. And then uh, STEP, TennesseeStep.org is a great resource and advocacy website in Tennessee. Uh, and they have a series of short little YouTube videos parent that explain advocacy in the schools from the parent's perspective. So if you have a parent that has trouble reading, that would be another great resource because they can watch a video about it. And sometimes they will even uh, send advocates to IEP meetings uh, with the parent to go with them. And so this is gonna be a one pager that'll be kind of posted in the different pods at the clinic. So if you wanna reference any of these main points later, or kind of the protocol that I would recommend when kids come in with academic concerns, you'll kind of have it at your fingertips there. And just public service announcement, get a release of information, right? Initially, if you have these concerns, because it saves a lot of time and a lot of appointments too, if, uh, if you can get it on the front end. So what questions do you all have? Yes. Is there any like, paid tutors that the public school system has stay after that's not necessarily a teacher? Um, like, is, that a, is that an old thing? I, so, you know, there's different for-profit companies like the Sylvan Learning Center and all that kind of stuff, but uh, I don't know of any uh, and then, you know, there's like Educare or the school specific after school programs where they might get some extra help with homework. Um, but I don't know of any specific like programs specifically for kids with learning disabilities. Um, some of the case law around special education uh, found that, you know, uh, there was a, a family that enrolled their kid in more intensive services kind of proved that it was way better than what the school was doing and then the school had to pay for those services. But that was all the way, you know, through that kind of litigation process, so. so when teachers are staying after school, it's just on their own time? Uh, I would assume so, yeah. Yes. Um, so like a lot of our parents will say, oh, they're getting speech in school, they're getting this therapy in school. Mm -hmm. Is that typically through RTI or is that typically kids that have IEPs? Okay, so kids are getting speech and OT yeah. through school. Is it through RTI or IEPs? So that's through an IEP. Okay. So there's actually uh, about 13 different pathways to an IEP. And specific learning disorders is just one of those pathways. And RTI only applies to specific learning disorders. So you're not gonna use RTI for anything else other than help with the reading and help with the math. So if a kid's getting speech or OT, then they've qualified for an IEP under those, one of those other 13 conditions. And so for those conditions, you don't, this, like, if anything else other than specific learning disorders, you're not even gonna go through this RTI process. You're just gonna write that letter to the school or you know, you're gonna, you will send the prescription, right, that this kid needs uh, OT or speech or kind of provide medical documentation of the need and then that'll get incorporated in apart from this whole other process. Yeah. I have a lot of kids that switch schools rather frequently as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I guess is it standardized enough to where they can be at one elementary school and then just continue on to the next 
It's, it's supposed to be, but practically I think the biggest difference is, is if they switch between city and county schools, right? Because then that RTI district director who's like saying standardizing everything for my district, you know, if you switch between schools there, it may be very similar versus having a whole nother director that's over the county schools and they maybe do it a different way. But hopefully you would have that, IE, that RTI team be able to evaluate the kind of the data that the kid comes with and see where, where they are from there. So, uh, it's the, so the question was, how do you, is there any way to expedite it when they're moving schools? Um, and so probably the schools are going to, you know, follow that process that I laid out unless some outside force intervenes, right? So I think that's where, if, I think our job is to try to identify these kids who are falling through the cracks for whatever reason. And it's usually not necessarily the kid who's been in the school and been there all their whole academic career, right? It's the kid who moved from Florida and then, you know, went to the county school and then had behavior problems and went to the city school and, you know, and all in one school year. And so I think that's, those kids I try to really, let's get all the records from everywhere and then talk to that RTI person at, at whatever school they're at and say, listen, this, is, this kid's really struggling and we need to figure out what's going on. Because the school's response might be, oh, well, all of these moves are an environmental factor that we can't rule out that that's the cause that, of the learning problem rather than a specific learning disorder. Um, so that's where I think the advocacy part comes in that um, that's, takes up a lot of time and it's hard to do on your own. And so I think that's where we could work together to, to try to figure out those cases. Did you comment on you know, what kids would qualify for a 504 plan versus an IEP? So the question was, what kids qualify for a 504 plan versus an IEP? And I started out this presentation going to review RTI, IEPs, 504 plans, and I was like, well, that's way too much information. So that'll be like part two. But 504 plans, um, that's not special education. It's covered under a different federal law. And so a lot of times 504 plans are if you have some kind of um, medical condition that's interfering with your academic. So if you have a broken leg and you need somebody to push you around in a wheelchair, you can get a 504 plan for that, right? Or if you have ADHD, you can qualify for a 504 plan. So a lot of times it's like a medical uh, diagnosis, but uh, it doesn't change the grade level that you're being taught at. Um, it can give you some practical accommodations like um, maybe preferential seating or extra time on tests, but it's not going to have these annual goals that are going to be tracked by the school like an IEP would. So with an IEP, you see this is your present level of performance in this area, and now let's kind of make some smart goals for you, and we're going to be held, the school's going to be held to meeting those goals year after year, and that kind of easily transfers with the kid throughout their school career, where the 504 plan is, uh, here's some accommodations, but we're not gonna really modify the curriculum that you're being taught. And sometimes it's a little bit harder to go from year to year. You have to kind of re-up it um, a little bit more. Um, I noticed, uh, well, both in the old system, there was psychosocial adversity as an exclusion, and in the RTI environment or an economic um, adversity as a uh, excluding condition. Yeah. I had a skewed patient population with an inpatient, but I would imagine most of the patient population could meet those criteria. Do, are they excluded from RTI simply because they're poor? Right. I, I don't. I think. I, I. I don't think practically they. I, uh, I mean, talking with the schools and everything, I don't think practically that I would hope kids are not being excluded for that because I don't know how you would rule that out, right? Um, I think uh, many, many of the kids that we meet with at the clinic. Uh, are come from low income households and they're still getting IEPs and um, so I'm not really sure where like practically how people would measure the impact of that on somebody's learning um, other than 
maybe I think absence is is where it comes into most practically if the kid's been absent 35 days this school year um, because the family doesn't have enough money for transportation or they can't get the kid to school you know maybe that's a secondary factor yeah and then a, a, a unrelated question just from more practical can if we have a, if I, we have a kid on the floors who is not ETSUP can we refer to BHC or should that be something they're yeah, so uh, you can talk to Dr. Toole or Don Tipton, but I think right now it's if the kid has their primary physician, their pediatrician at ETSU Peds, that's the population that our team's working with right now. Yeah. Yes. So what sort of advice do you usually give to parents if they're thinking about trying to get their own um, like learning disability testing outside of the school system or something like that? Good question. So the question was, what about parents who want to seek independent evaluations outside the school system? They, to they have the total right to do that, right? And we, we said that the, what would lead the school to initiate an IEP eval is if they suspect a disability is present, right? So RTI might be one source of data to suspect a disability. A parent writing a letter saying, my kid, I think I'm worried about them. I want an IEP eval. That might be another kind of piece of information. And then this outside psychoed testing might be another piece. So schools are required to consider those tests, but they're not required to follow the advice of that independent evaluation. So it's like another data point, right? And you would think like if it's really obvious and we've already gone and done We've already gone and done the testing kind of for you and made it easier for you, you know, that some schools might be able to work with you and, and incorporate that into the IEP already, um, but they don't have to by law. So when you're talking with families, like those evaluations are really expensive too. If they have the means to do it, great, but it's still not a guaranteed shot, even if that independent psychologist says definitely has dyslexia, you know, the school has to consider it, but not necessarily do anything about it. Um, the if you go through the due process piece, you can get to a point where the parents can request an independent evaluation at the school's expense. So if you kind of go rogue and go outside the system, that's one way to do it, but you can also work the system from the inside and end up getting that same evaluation, but the school to pay for it. Yeah, good question. Yes? Uh, this may be between nuts and bolts, I just had a question about the baseline RTI screening. Um, mm -hmm. Is it triannual? Like, does that coincide with other testing, or is it its own special thing? Yeah, so the question was about benchmark screening three times a year. Like, what's up with that? Um, I'm not, honestly, I'm not real sure about um, the, the nitty gritty mechanics of how that works. I just know that they have these benchmark standardized assessments that they would give three times a year that I, I don't know exactly when they give them, but I assume it would be kind of spaced out, you know, throughout the year, um, that, that everybody gets those. And so that kind of determines your percentile and that determines if you get pulled into RTI. Yeah. Any other questions? It's a complex subject, it really is. And so uh, it's, it's something that it's worth uh, doing research on outside of this too, but um, now that I've, gotten into it, I can, I can help you guys out in the clinic practically, I think, and hopefully that one-pager will be just a quick reference. Dr. Smith had that idea, so I have to give him credit for the one-pager. Um, and help you guys out, even if I'm not there, to kind of know what to do, at least initially, before we do a follow-up uh, evaluation. All right, thanks, guys.